Okay, fantastic. I think we are all good to go. So ladies, welcome and welcome to our audience. I'm Kerry Dorman. I am head mentor at Sinclair Dorman and currently the People's Mentoring Champion for the UK. So I'm really excited. We've got a superb group of, of ladies from the tech industry from the UK and the States joining me today for a wonderful conversation about the importance of mentoring and sponsorship with our career. So we've all experienced it at some point and we are really keen to, to share and explore. So if it's okay, I'd like us all just to kick off with a brief introduction and I'm going to follow my Zoom guide, which uh, is Deborah, you're up first. Oh, thank you for having me, Carrie. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Debbie Heiser. I'm the CEO and founder of The Mentor Project, and I'm an applied developmental psychologist um, with a focus on aging, and that does play into mentorship, which I'll be able to talk a little bit more about later. Brilliant. Thank you, Debbie. Do you prefer Debbie or Deborah? Debbie is fine. Debbie's good. Excellent. Thank you. April. Great, Carrie. Um, thank you for having me. My name is April Mo, and I am the Chief Officer of SUSE. Uh, we're one of the largest open source technology companies out there in the world. Uh, I'm also the executive sponsor of um, SUSE's Women in Tech Network, um, which is you know one of the the biggest employee networks within SUSE. Uh, we have over 200 really active members, and so. I'm really excited to discuss a topic today that is so close to my heart. Thank you, April. And Loretta. Hi, Kerry. Delighted to be here today. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Loretta Eustace, and I am a vice president within the Global Technology Services of Northern Trust. Um, I'm currently working and uh, focused on a platform and organizational transformation initiative, which is quite exciting. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, my experience, I guess, with sponsorship and mentoring. Um, I would say sponsorship and mentoring because it was in that order. Um, and it came to me quite late in my career. Um, I grew up with a mother who, was, who believed in the, the golden age of Hollywood, where you know, there's this notion that if you did a great job, you'd just be discovered. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so it was a very passive, uh, if you like, um, way of dealing with your career. And it, not surprisingly, that did work too well. Um, however, I did uh, later find uh, somebody who was a, a great ally of mine, if you like, and somebody who had been a peer and went on to be a manager of mine. And they were the first real advocate for me. So this is where my sponsorship came on. Um, and when this, this lovely lady went on maternity leave, um, she advocated that I would take over running the department globally while she was gone, which was a, a fairly substantial step up. Um, I was very fortunate at the time as well to have a technology director who believed in giving people a chance because that's also important. Um, and then also in giving them the best chance for success. Um, so this was how I found myself with my first sponsor my first mentor <laughs> and for me this was a period of really enormous professional growth and um, that I would be so enthusiastic about encouraging and and if you like passing on to everybody that I've dealt with since then yeah fantastic I love that story Loretta I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up on it I'm gonna come back to it if that's okay with you and Sarah hi Kerry thank you so much for inviting me I'm so excited to be a part of this um, I, so currently I'm a, a head of product marketing for our financial crime portfolio at BA Systems Applied Intelligence. Um, and for me, mentoring has had both a, obviously a very deeply personal impact, but also a professional one. I've been very lucky and much like Loretta was outlining to have been mentored officially and unofficially um, in the past, which has really helped me from a sort of personal motivation and support point of view. Um, and it's actually through one of those mentors that I've had the opportunity to engage with mentoring at a more professional level um, when we kicked off our RISE initiative, which is our um, mentoring scheme targeted at women in cyber. It's a BAE systems led initiative, but it's pan industry. So um, it includes partners across the cyber spectrum. And we're in comparison to these ladies, it's probably one of the, the new kids on the block. We only just started. 
uh, at the end of last year, but we've already got around 100 members and I'm delighted to be leading that. So enjoying the benefits of mentoring, both from a professional standpoint and personally. Yeah, fantastic. And also, um, when we come to have a look at a few of the initiatives that are in place, can we come back to, to RISE? Because it, it's very exciting and, and I love what you're doing there. So um, before we get into some really meaty topics about uh, mentoring and sponsoring, we, sponsorship, um, can we just explore what they actually mean, what the differences are, and if you can morph from one to the other? So Loretta, I'm going to ask you because of your wonderful story that you've just shared with us, uh, <laughs> what your what your thoughts are on the on the differences between um, a sponsor and a mentor and actually a coach, if you if you would like to just insert that too. Sure. And um, well, I suppose if you start off with coaching, I mean, coaching is very much geared towards um, equipping you to do a specific task. So it's short term. It's got a clear objective and, and it's cut and dry. You can have many coaches. Uh, through your career. Um, mentoring is a little bit longer term. There is a bit of investment and it's a bit like it's like finding a friend. You know, it, it, there's a relationship that you have to build up there of trust. It tends to be mutual as well. Um, I find it very interesting um, in listening to stories that you, you hear very much of how the mentor gets as much out of it as the mentee. So it's, it's very much a mentor to mentor kind of a relationship instead of uh, a mentor to mentee. But for me, what that is, it's, it's about um, almost providing somebody the license to believe in themselves, to um, explore what they're doing um, and to help direct a little bit, provide a little bit of guidance and also give them license as well to look at what, you know, they're potential future direction could be. So it's, it's a far more long-term investment and it's very much more, you know, about where you can go, what are your possibilities and how do you almost fulfill yourself? Okay, so it's not just about role either. And then when you come to sponsorship, so sponsorship to me is the least safe of all of these, right? Because when somebody sponsors you, they're putting their own reputation on the line. Um, they've made an investment with you within their network to basically say, I'm introducing this person to you and this person is, is going to live up to my own professional standards, if you like. So there's an integrity that, that is part of that too. Um, and so what you find or what I found is, is very often many, many people are keen to be mentors and very few people are keen to be sponsored. <laughs> so from my perspective, though, sponsorship is really where the huge difference comes. Go, don't get me wrong, mentorship is, is fantastic and it actually helps you to accomplish what you can within that role. But in order potentially to get that role in the first place, you may need a sponsor. Yeah, brilliant. That's great. And I wonder, Deborah, is it the same, is it the same perception over in the US as it is over in the UK and Ireland? You know, if we're talking about mentorship, um, mentorship is 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 a pretty multifaceted um, t term that we uh, oftentimes in the US equate with just hierarchical looking for someone above us. Um, but I love Loretta how you also talked about, you know, mentor to mentor. So within the US, we really do look at mentorship from the point of view of a mentor, you know, giving guidance, skills, knowledge to someone who's newer, um, who's just starting out. But there's also a term that um, we've been coining at the Mentor Project called lateral mentorship. And that is taking people who work side by side. So all of our biggest um, tech revolutions have happened. Our biggest ones have happened, not by someone having a mentor above us, but someone having a mentor beside us. So if you look at Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, they couldn't have accomplished what they did without each other but neither one was the boss. So within the US, we see a lot of our tech happening with side-by-side -side mentorship or what I call lateral mentoring. So getting an expert in a different area to help <clears throat> in another area to combine to make some huge impact that has made us so we don't use the wall phone that has the long giant cord anymore that, our, that we now carry our phones in our hands. Um, all of these technologies that we take for granted now were from lateral mentorship and those make the biggest explosion. Yeah, okay, I love that. So that's actually a reasonably fresh term 
uh, for me because I, I guess we would normally refer to it as peer to peer, but is that the same or is it slightly, slightly different? No, it's, it's different in the sense that if you really break down what's happening with lateral mentoring, it's what happened in say, for example, Bell Labs um, in the US where you would take a hardware engineer who would wheel himself in his wheelie office chair next to a software engineer and say, hey, I have this idea. Uh, we need to accomplish this as a team. I need your expertise to make this happen. And so the person would offer their advice. That would carry on the same way mentorship does, the same way you saw Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak carry their relationship farther, the same way mentors do. You know, they didn't then say, see you later after one question was answered. Peer to peer seems to be more like that, whereas lateral mentoring is more of a long term, longer term relationship in that respect. Yeah. Okay, that makes absolute sense to me. Um, brilliant. Okay, so I wanted to explore um, the fact that we have proven statistics that mentoring has such a positive impact um, on, on someone's career. And um, I want to explore why there is still reticence, despite the, the proven statistics and case studies, why there is still reticence to get involved, either from a mentor's point of view or from a mentee's point of view. And Sarah and, um, and then April, Sarah, can I start with you just because I know that um, you are involved in the running of, a, of an initiative. Um, what, what, what's your thoughts on that? So I think there's a, Sarah. oh, sorry, carry on April. No, I was just gonna clarify if that was for, for Sarah, but I think so. I think it's, so I, I, there, I think there are a lot of different elements to this. Um, I think one of them is potentially a bit of a subconscious anxiety about the vulnerability that mentoring does open you up to and that you have to, you have to reach in order to have a meaningful connection in that mentor-mentee relationship. Um, and I think there's also, especially in tech, uh, there's still a residual squeamishness about what would be considered a kind of a soft skill. Um, and it's interesting because you referenced the research and what the research, really hard scientific research shows us is that um, the reason that women leave jobs in technology that they've been in for 10, 15 years is because they feel isolated and they feel alone and they feel uh, demotivated, all of which are things which mentoring is directly um, trying to address and help people through. So the science, um, you know, really shows us that that soft skill is central to uh, to making sure that you retain and encourage your workforce in the direction that you want it to go. Um, I think the third element, and I speak specifically from the point of view of someone whose mentoring scheme is designed um, to support women, is that there is a feeling that it is perhaps a little self-indulgent and um, people are reticent to maybe make that time available, they're busy, or to ask, especially to ask for that kind of time from somebody else. Um, and that's the kind of thing that I really hope we can push past, because as anybody who's been in a rewarding mentor-mentee relationship will know, um, the benefits of it and, and sort of a byproduct of it is the fact that you recognize the value and you're likely, you're much more likely to pass it on. Um, so it really isn't a, a selfish act. It's actually something which uh, ultimately, you know, can really benefit other people as well. Yeah, that whole pay it forward. Exactly. And, you know, um, and, and, and God forbid, as women, that we do actually spend time on ourselves and our own yes. personal growth and development. I mean, you know, <laughs> Don't ask for anything. a whole, whole new concept, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I just wanted to point out that Sue Black was interviewed precisely on this point, wasn't she, by the FT just... Um, well, it came across my, my, my desk just recently from you, actually, mm. and, uh, and she was making that point, wasn't she, about the fact exactly. that, yeah, that um, keeping women in tech mid-career is so important because they feel so isolated and that mentoring was a real key to that. In fact, she's been men she's mentored over 100 women, I think. Um, mm. Yeah, it's that was phenomenal. 
great insight. So April, what, what are your thoughts about this? I, I know that you have some. Why do you think there's still reticence? Yeah, so so I'll start by saying that, you know, I consider myself to be a, a product. Everything that I have and, 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 and am enjoying my career, I mean, this is all a product of mentoring. Um, and as I think about it, I mean, I fit both sides of, sides of the equation. I'm, I'm currently a mentor to both women and men, uh, also a mentee. I, I sit at the feet of, you know, some of the most incredible mentors and we have the, just the most powerful conversations. And to me, I think through my own lived experience, I feel like there are a couple things that, you know, I, I know I've, I felt reticence for as I, as I think about my capacity as a mentee and as a mentor. So I love what Sarah said, which is sometimes we just don't feel like we're entitled to that level of self-care that, you know, that is self-indulgent and that really just directly hooked into, for me, a sense of the imposter syndrome, which is, ugh, what if I, what, what if I, what if I unpack all of these with a mentor and realize that I have nothing to offer? What if I'm exposed in that conversation? So it's really wrapped into, you know, all of the insecurity, the imposter syndrome, and just a general wall of, will I still be accepted by this person, my mentor, who I respect? Because at the back of my mind, there's always that. And I believe that this applies to a lot of women out there too. Yeah. As, oh, I hope you continue to accept me, even if for some reason I'm proven to be less than what you thought I was. And I think that that's the number one thing that for me I've had to overcome, which is I deserve that time that somebody really feels like I'm worth their time investment and their effort. And to accept and to own that fact and to occupy that space was the number one thing I felt. Um, I have to say this as a woman of color um, that you know, there's also at the back of my mind, actually not at the back of my mind, at the forefront of my mind as I think about my mentor is, will this person appreciate the additional nuances that come with not just being a woman in tech, but a woman of color in tech, yeah. right? Because there are nuances. And I don't require for my mentor to be, you know, Asian American. I don't, I don't expect them to be um, culturally the same. Um, I really enjoy diversity. But what I really, what keeps me a little bit hesitant at times is the question, will this person understand or seek to understand the nuances of the challenges that I face and accept that this is what it is, right? On my account, based on what I'm saying, and then meet me where I'm at. I think this really ties back to the notion of acceptance. When, when you get into a committed relationship with a mentor, you really want to be seen as a whole person. And, you know, I think cultural identity, ethnicity, that is so fundamental to who I am. So that is for me in my lived experience, a reticence that, that that I encounter as I think about mentor. Yes, I was going to say that that really resonates with me where I've come across a lot of mentoring initiatives that are basically fulfilling a tick box exercise and the mind and time commitment is not there and they it, there's there's th that um, that wonderful importance of all the different unique nuances that diversity brings are washed over in order to be able to, as I said, provide that tick in the box. Exactly. So that's a brilliant point, April. And um, so how how do we how do we get over that? Is that just spreading the word and breaking down the the, the barriers of perceptions that that's not what true mentoring and sponsorship is all about? You know, some of some of the best um, mentors I've had are the ones who are not afraid to get into uncomfortable conversations with me. And I think that, you know, to begin with, um, what I have found to be really helpful in, in starting a relationship with a mentor, two things that are really that have been really helpful for me. Number one, agree on a time time frame. Because one of the things that, you know, does um, kind of just um, that, that is top of mind for me before I commit to being a mentor is the notion of, I want to make sure that I'm not just a mentor by name, that I can very proudly live up to my commitment to you as a mentor. 
And so I have open conversations with people as a mentor, as a mentee about time commitment, right? And I talk about time frame because what if we get into a relationship and we realize that, hey, you know, maybe we're better off as friends and professional networks, but, you know, mentor side of things, maybe it's, 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 uh, it's, let's not force it, right? So I want it to be productive on both sides and it is a chemistry check as well. So we start, we say, do you want to, do you want to, you know, just kind of have a conversation about where we're at in six months? And that actually takes a load off of, you know, uh, my chest and off my mentor's chest as well, because we say, in six months, we're, we have agreed and are committed to having a, a wonderful, pr productive, civil conversation about where this is leading. The second one is the whole notion of just, um, do you accept me for who I am, even with the fact that I am different from you, if, if my mentor is very different from me, and that we're going to talk, you know, and, and I'm going to be able to trust that, even if you don't understand, that we will wrestle in that in that in that gray area together right just undergirded by trust but we will wrestle together i think the commitment to wrestle together to have a friend in that wrestle i think that that has been a very important element for me to establish i think that's a great phrase let's wrestle together so debbie can we come back to the mentor project just because there must be the, the the way that you have promoted it and now just remind me how many people you have on the project. In fact, can you just tell us a little bit about it? Because it is sure. an amazing, fascinating. Absolutely. We formed the mentor, the mentor project is a, is, was formed because people were having experts in the field. The, one of the fathers of the firewall, the person who patented how we use credit cards on the internet, all these folks in tech um, and in STEM came out and they said, we, are retiring. Um, we are at the peak of our careers and now we don't know how to give back. How do I give back? They couldn't find mentees. And that's a huge problem uh, because the, we have the most precious natural resource in our world, which is our experts who don't know where they can give back. We hear countless stories of mentees who have the struggle of finding a mentor, but the struggle is just as real for mentors looking to give back. So we started the mentor project not knowing what would happen. And people said to, said to me, oh, good luck with that, you know, finding people who are gonna wanna help out who are experts and leaders in fields. Well, last year we had 10 in january and you know people just said hey i'd like to join i'd like to join this was all organic we now have more than 80 and we have an enormous waiting list and these literally are leaders in the field that people we now give access to any kid around the world we're in six countries now um we're all across the u.s we're on television, we have podcasts, we have more than 200 video content hours. We have, um, we're finishing up our second hackathon, but our first one yielded a team that did such a remarkable cybersecurity um, project that because the mentors got involved, uh, so it was a hackathon with mentors help, you know, the kids could ask questions, it's patentable. Uh, we patent kids for free uh, our first patent pending, uh, you know, happened in January. Everything is really fast tracked and we never knew the issues that mentors face in trying to find mentees around the world. And so we've sort of untapped this and that's what the mentor project is about. We're mentor focused, but because of that, the kids, we know the kids are gonna, the mentees are gonna flourish. And as long as you can tap in mentors with what they want their legacy to be, what they want their, how they want to be productive, what their passion is, there's a mentee waiting to connect with them. And we're finding that to be really just a pleasure on all ends. We're also finding, which we also didn't know would happen, is our mentors are connecting. And just before I hopped on here, two of our mentors connected and they just put out an article in nature. So we're seeing linguists connecting with people who um, are 
leaders in say um, uh, different areas of science. We have a puppeteer who paired up with an engineer and they're teaching quantum mechanics to little kids who are kindergartners through puppetry. All this stuff that's happening with our mentors who are mentoring each other and then mentoring to the kids. It's just a mentoring ball. That's amazing. I've got this, these mentoring waves going across the US, you know, it's all and the, the, the roll on effect. Amazing. Loretta, what about you? Have you, there's a, tell us about the mentoring initiatives that you're involved with. So um, Northern Trust actually has a, a large number of mentoring programs going on. And, and I suppose if I, if I bring it a little bit back to the previous question, which was around, you know, why don't people get involved? I mean, certainly if I, I said, you know, it came to me quite late in my career. And one of the reasons would have been I was a software developer. So, you know, I got my head down. I go and meet with my manager maybe once or twice a week. And they really just want to know how far have you gotten? What are your stumbling blocks? How are we going to get past them? And so the whole notion of this, if you like, career conversation was something that was had at best once every six months. Whereas, you know, so for me, a mentoring program that might have been offered to me at that time would have been irrelevant, you know, because all my whole life was, I have got this much work to do. I have to deliver it back there. And really, there was no career conversation, you know, so of what I see now, it, it's just, it's, it's super. We have an explosion of, of mentoring programs that are happening globally in Northern Trust. So it's, it's done through a couple of different types of initiatives. Um, we have a large number of mentoring circles or lean-in circles that are happening. So we've got an Ireland-based group that I'm part of as well. And I actually find that quite interesting, um, particularly because, you know, very much in, initially anyway, the participants are they're so wary of each other and so... You know, these are people who, you know, they're they're not the most junior in their careers, but they're an early stage in their career. And they're great at talking to each other until you put them into a situation where they feel they might be vulnerable. And it's it's a real area of growth to actually help them to overcome, if you like, that fear in the first place. And that's going to stand them in, in, in time to come. And we've also got um, UK mentoring circles. So these were, you know, we had one that was being run in 2020 waiting at the moment because of COVID to see whether it's going to run this year as well. Um, but this was for partners in London and in Guernsey. Um, so they would have been in circles of like six to eight mentees with two mentors. Um, and it was, you know, kind of created based, the circles were created based on your official title. So essentially your, your rank within the company. And um, that's changing a little bit now. Um, we also had more global mentoring circles going on. Um, we won actually that started in January this year. And it's running until July. So we're, we're going to see how this is going to work now. Um, what we've actually found is that um, apart from everything else, um, our global lockdowns and, and what have you has meant that we're almost all on a level playing field. Our, our networking, our, our uh, water cooler moments are gone. And so, you know, it's become even more important that we are, are connecting with each other on a, perhaps a less formal level. Um, and using these tools to do it now means that we can actually have cohorts that are not located in, in the same area at all. So that's, it's quite exciting. It's quite new. That is and this is one exciting. of the things that's going on. Tell me, are they are um, all these circles, are they, are they tech specific? And so some of them are and some of them are not. Um, we're, we're very much at the moment, and I, I did say we're undergoing, if you like, a, a, an organisational uh, transformation. And mm -hmm. part of that transformation is actually to bring tech and the business much closer together. Um, and, and so, yes, it, it, it's, we're breaking down those barriers as well, if you like, um, particularly in financial services. Um, tech has long been seen as a service or a an expense within the business but the business if you like is what actually uh, is it, the the value chain it's a value line that's now changing with fintech as well um, and we're having to adapt in order to be able to grow and so technology is becoming far more center stage and as um, a part of that we're also <laughs> getting a lot more respect i'd say across the business as well so th these collaborations um, are working out mostly very well Still a little bit rested in some places, but actually um, the mentoring circle is a great place to break that down. Yeah, I, I love the mentoring circle initiative. That's great. And Sarah, with BAE, tell us about RISE, because I the, the one thing that I'm really keen for you to share is that it's open for, for everybody, anybody. Is that right? That's absolutely right. And I think it's um, it's probably a little un unexpected, especially given that it's it's from uh, a BAE, obviously a very... Um, 
uh, a defense company we've like uh like Loretta was saying, we do have our own um, various different mentoring um, groups internally, but what we wanted to do with this one was to create something, the primary object of which was to support women in cyber. That meant attracting them, but also retaining them. And our theory on it really was that whilst we'd love to retain the women that we have working in cyber, um, the broader goal is to make sure that, that the industry is supportive. And for that, we need to build an ecosystem. And we've been able, we've been very fortunate. I think there's just been so much interest in it. We've partnered with, with numerous different um, organizations, Microsoft, Talus, DSTL. Um, we've got global, we've got mentors and mentees globally. Um, but the idea is really that um, the women who are mentees in this organization can, when, as part of RISE, can, um, can find out what else is out there in terms of cyber. It's not just um, it's not just what's within that organization. If they're interested in looking at something different, we're able to provide that as well. Um, and ideally, we, you know, we're making sure that there's an environment for, for women that they can explore different avenues and really get the most out of working in cyber. Um, and you know, ultimately, the rising tide raises all ships, and that's what we're hoping to achieve with RISE. Okay, fantastic. So if this sparks interest with anybody in our audience, how would they get involved? So we've got um, various different uh, bits on our website, but I can also share details um, in the chat. I'm not sure if that's a possibility or um, uh, or on LinkedIn. We've got okay. details on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Gosh, so as well as um, We Are The City and Women in Tech Mentoring Schemes, which April, I know you're, you're a sponsor of. Thank you. Um, there is, there's lots going on, isn't there, out there uh, that's available to all sorts of, um, of, of women. So let's hope that this does what we're hoping for it to do, which is to break down the barriers that it is available. And it's just such a, a wonderfully satisfying initiative to get into with mentoring. So um, I do have one, one last question before I ask you all for a top tip. I, was, I, I want to explore about the what you think um, about me mentoring men in order to promote women within tech and how important is it and i'm going to ask april to um to, to start this conversation please absolutely so carrie maybe i'll tackle your questions in, on, on two fronts which is you know the, the idea of mentoring men uh to support women in tech and also the idea of how men can you know, probably how men can become allies to women in tech. Um, I think the, the the first part of it, mentoring men, I that to me, so I have a couple of male mentees and um, in both relationships, they have approached me um, and they have asked, hey, I really want to learn from you. So I am fortunate in that sense that I, I, I had these, you know, just willing parties um, opening up to me and saying, I want to be better. And that is a mindset that that already comes with the mentees I have. They want to be better, not just in a you know professional setting, but also I what, what is implied in, in this engagement is that they want to be better advocates and they want to be better allies. And how can that be? Right. So so I think mentoring men is really important. Um, keeping an eye out for, you know, for men who are really keen on supporting women in tech and then establishing that frank, honest relationship that is completely life-giving. I think that that's really important too. And I think those are the ingredients of just what goes into a really successful uh, mentorship experience uh, with men. Mm. Can I just pick up on that phrase, which I, yeah. I think is brilliant. So what does it mean to be an ally to women. What does that actually mean? Because there in itself is, is a barrier I know it exists. You know, some there's a, a lot of men out there who have the best will in the world to be an ally, but actually they just haven't quite got it yet. So how oh, you're you, still spot on. How yeah. would you how would you approach that? Absolutely. Um so I approach that with honesty and I approach that with the um, really with the theme that because I respect and I love our relationship, I will not give, you know, the people that I speak with um, anything less than my honesty. And it is in, in 
in such a trusted relationship, I'm able to get engaged into uncom uncomfortable conversations is back to the theme again, which is every time we talk about making a difference, it means stirring the balance. And every time we need to stir or shake the balance, it's uncomfortable. And I think the 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 very first the very first step is to really embrace that discomfort. And what I do with a lot of really well-meaning, well-intentioned, super kind-hearted, just engaged uh, mill colleagues um, is I share with them upfront that as you know, if they're asking me what can they do, I say the first thing to do is to really be prepared to listen. And, I'll, and, and as I unpack that, I like to draw out the, the, the idea that um, a good check for you know, any type of ally, it doesn't have to be just men for women, it can be you know, for people who are wanting to be allies for uh, people of color, right? Or the LGBTQI plus community in any aspect, I think the one thing that I constantly check with my, within myself that I ask our male allies to check within themselves would be, are you inserting yourself and making yourself the narrative of this story? And if you are, that's probably not helpful. And let me give an example of that. I had a conversation with you know, a very well-meaning male colleague uh, with a really great idea, according to him, about how he can help women. And I won't go into too, too, too much detail here, but the idea to him was a good one. But I think to women, it would, it would feel like, wait a minute, it, looks, it, it feels a little bit strange because the hero of this idea would actually be him. And so when I discussed the idea with him, and of course it's an uncomfortable conversation, I, 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 I took the opportunity to say, hey, so in this scenario, the spotlight, the engagement, the equipping, the, the arming, all of these good things, they're actually not benefiting the, the women in question, right? They're benefiting you. Mm -hmm. when, you're, when you become a part of the narrative for a people group that you're trying to serve, then you're no longer actually an ally. And let's think about how we can you know, turn that ship around and, and help you achieve the goal. I am one of the people that you're trying to serve. Let me speak into this and let me help you become a better ally. And then, and then it, it triggers to the next part of the conversation, which is an important one to point out, which is he, he felt genuinely bad. Like, oh my gosh, thank you for saying that. I feel really bad now. Um, and then continues to express that he feels really terrible. Really, and this is where I say, thank you for listening to me, but don't make your emotions, again, central to this theme. Let's, let's turn the ship around and just you know, move on and just say, here's how we can support. Because self-flagellation to somebody with such great intention is not the goal, right? Um, expressing that, oh, I'm, I feel really bad for the terrible plight that, you know, that this group is facing is really not the focus. And if that becomes the focus, then that, it, that becomes central to the narrative and that becomes self-defeating. Yep. And so I always kind of use that as a checkpoint to say, what is becoming central? And is it actually, are we keeping the people, people that we're trying to serve really central to the narrative? If we're not, then let's find a way that we can keep them firmly, firmly in the center of the narrative. Yeah, brilliant. I love that. That feeds into my my whole mantra of awareness, self reflection, and that whole you know continuing cycle that we need to go through to make sure that that we're all very aware of what we're trying to do and the message that we're trying to get across and and who it actually affects beneficially. So. Um, I think we're really sadly coming to the end of our time. It's gone really quickly, but I do want to finish off with a top tip from everybody in terms of mentoring, mentorship, sponsorship, and, and it could be anything to do with just getting involved or be aware of, or well, something that really comes from your core in terms of, of, of mentoring. And Debbie, I'd like to start with you. I'd like to say, <clears throat> One of the biggest things on uh, for mentoring overall is don't make assumptions. Um, every avenue that I've ever heard that people are talking about issues they have with mentoring is that they have an assumption, an assumption that the mentor won't be receptive to them, an assumption mm -hmm. that someone isn't going to uh, advocate for them or, or that they won't uh, have a connection in some way. 
find out by asking. Um, so put yourself out there. Don't live by assumptions, whether you're going to be a mentor or whether you're going to be a mentee. Great dialogues make everything happen. So, and that starts by not assuming anything. Excellent, love it. Thank you, Debbie. April. I would say definitely own the space. I, I mean, that just, you know, if, if there's space set aside for you, somebody already believes in you, own that space and, and believe that, you know, that 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 is that is room that is you deserve to be in. Brilliant. Loretta. And I guess what I would say is that um, if you're not in a mentoring relationship, see if you can find a mentor, it will be well worth it to you. But I would also, I would kind of challenge mentors to see, can you be advocates for somebody? Would you be willing to be a sponsor? Because I think that's an area really that is less comfortable. And I think we need more people in that space. Yeah, so true. So true. Thank you, Sarah. I think um, at a most basic level, not to underestimate the impact that mentoring can make. I think it's easy to gloss over it and it's so fundamental and to Loretta's point, like really most, you know, we can all benefit from having a mentor and probably being one as well. Um, it's, it's really, very critical to one's career. And I think the second one, which I've thought of while we've been chatting has been the sort of continual evolution of how we think about mentoring and to try and challenge ourselves to always be developing that. I've been writing down notes from some of the things that um, the women have been saying because there's there's so much to do to kind of progress it. It's a it's a growing thing. It's not a stagnant uh, set piece. And yeah, I think that's pretty exciting and definitely worth bearing in mind. Yeah, I totally agree. And and I just want to finish off by saying that there are women like this amazing panel that we have here who are always up for being contacted and answering a question or signposting. You know, it's um, it, we are, I call mentors, people who are engaged in mentors, real givers. We're really happy to give, whether that's a quick call or a text or, or, or an email. Um, so please don't ever feel shy. Be bold and curious is my, is my message. So we're going to go on to the Q&A now. Uh, there is a question that is burning that uh, I, I'm going to answer as an immediate and then we'll go on to the panel. And that is, what if I don't like my mentor or if we don't gel or if there's no chemistry? So I'm going to ask Loretta what that what you would do in that particular case. So it is it is quite like I mean you can be lucky with mentors you can be unlucky with mentors I mean you don't have to be like minded but the relationship has to work in the same way that a friendship effectively can work so if your relationship with your mentor is not working I think it was something that April said earlier you should respectfully step away from that and just say you know what maybe our relationship is better at a different level but not as a mentor mentor in, in, mentoring relationship and um, so yeah that would be my advice respectfully step back they won't all work yeah great and debbie what do you do if there's a mismatch on your on the mentor project well mentoring is not marriage so i think that um we're very very clear and upfront um if it doesn't work or if you want to ask the question of somebody else go for it um, and we've noticed that that does happen occasionally, but there's no, it's not personal in that manner. We aren't putting, um, we aren't putting a value judgment on that. So if someone jumps to someone else, uh, everyone's happy. It's fine. And I think that if we can store, sort of remove the value judgment that, oh no, I'm going to be hurting somebody's feelings or they're going to be crushed. Um, they're going to be okay. It's fine. Yeah, take that whole personal effect away from it. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, I think we've come to the end and that would, that's gonna lead on to the actual Q&A.